Well, Michael, it's been just great learning more and more every time I talk to you about stuff that uh, has been pertinent in your life. Uh, we haven't gotten to the very basic stuff about how do you craft your sound because you show up and you've got a, a rig that is just, to most, space age and you're, you're so familiar with it and you've got all your tones programmed and everything. Everybody goes, how does he do it? You know, I... I um... I would say that um, first of all, I I am a uh, a nerd, a guitar nerd. I have spent like a good part of my life sitting in my home programming sounds, working on rigs. I've spent a fortune on um, guitars, um, amps, and really what I have done is like I would I just when I was younger I would buy a guitar experience it for a while and then most of the time I'd, I would sell it and get another one because I didn't really have the money to go to have a collection so I would you know oh, I want to uh, I want a Stratocaster I want to find out how to play a Stratocaster you know so um, I'd get one of those I grew up on a Gibson 340 which is pretty much like 335 yeah. that my parents bought for me from Johnny Smith Music I wish I still had that guitar. Yeah. I don't. So, you know, my roots were kind of um, um, a little bit of everything. Jazz, rock, jazz, uh, blues jazz, I really got into it for a while. And then classic rock from that era. Um, so I was experimenting with amplifiers and guitars and pedals the whole time, you know, all the way up. Um, one, one thing that changed my um, whole approach to rigs and, and live performance equipment was I, I was um, I had my instrumental band playing in LA and I met uh, Steve Picaro at a party you know he was the key keyboard player for um, Toto. Toto and the Porcaro brothers are just they were they're all amazing musicians. Jeff Picaro, who's gone, of course, just created the feel, that kind of like that famous feel. Um, but anyway, so I met him in a party, and we started talking. I said, oh, Stephen, yeah, I'm playing, you know, down at the Central on Tuesday night with my band. And he said, oh, good, I'm going to come and hear you play, right? And I, oh, that's great. Well, he got down there, and we started playing. I Not too long into the set, um, my my pedals started messing up, and everything went to hell. I was crawling around on the floor, looking, trying to get figure out what was problems. You know what the problem was, and you know, I mean, you know, not that, not that it was the most important thing, but I wanted to. I really wanted to have the possibility to maybe work with Steve in the future. You know. And, but anyway, that happened, and I decided that night that I was going to start going with processors hardwired into one rig. So all I had to do was basically pull out a couple of cords, plug in the speakers, pull out the pedal, plug in the, the control pedal, and go. So that's basically what I did. And that's not saying that I don't still have issues live playing sometimes. I do, but a lot less. And so I started getting into the um, power amp world, Mesa Boogie. You know, Mesa Boogie, um, I've owned a, about every one of their stereo power amps. Ended up with the uh, Mesa Boogie Stereo Simul Class 290, which, which is uh, basically kind of like two twin reverbs packed into a little, you know, very heavy rack mounted <laughs> two space. Um, amplifier and then I had preamps which were processors and I it got into the world of programming so you know I could just get if I was playing a blues gig I could just push this pedal down and I had my blues tone if I was playing a you know a heavy metal gig bam I go to that tone 
Um, if I'm doing with what I'm doing with my project, which is going to be using a bunch of different sounds, I have them right, all accessed right there. And I don't have a million pedals out on the floor with possibilities of wires shorting out, batteries going dead, and all that stuff. And um, the, as far as guitars, uh, I, I just am a traditional guy pretty much. I pretty much Strats and Les Pauls are my go-to. I grew up on Gibsons and then stopped playing them for pretty much 35 years and played Strats. I just love the versatility of a Strat, um, all the, the tremolo stuff you can do, and I worked really hard at um, learning how to use a tremolo. And it, I think they're very expressive. You can almost... When I play, I like to, a lot of the times, um, emulate as much as I can maybe a human voice. A uh, female voice is very, to me, one of the most expressive instruments on, in the universe. So I try and go for, on a lot of my songs that are more um, melancholy, I will try and get more like a female voice approach to to my guitars but um, that strats are very good for that um, then I started buying some Les Pauls again and got back into the Gibson world and um, bought a, a Gary Moore Les Paul which I just love I don't take it out too much because it weighs almost 10 pounds I can play it a set and that's about it and and then I have some newer Les Pauls um, one is uh, I was gifted a beautiful um, 2005 chambered black Les Paul uh, that uh, when my friend Terry Oren passed away, he had a collection, and his fan, his brother said, "Mike, you know Terry would have wanted you to have had one of his guitars. Um, come over next week and pick out which one you want." And I, I picked out this beautiful black Les Paul, which I'm almost afraid to take out because it's it's in mint condition and it was a special gift. Um, but all those Les Pauls, to me, um, e each one, even though they have a specific sound that's familiar to Gibson, um, each one has a little different tonality to it. You know, I have a 2015 Les Paul um, traditional, which really is supposed to kind of play and feel like the old ones. And I have to say that it really does. And it's a very... Um, very fat but warm sound um, and they're using more traditional mahogany on that a lighter weight mahogany which to me has a more of a nice mid-range kind of like ooh or ah kind of sound to it um, overall I would say that over the last um, 55 years of my playing and it's all come back down to simplicity. What is the simplest, really most standard thing where you don't, where it doesn't get in the way of your playing? So, you know, uh, a guitar that stays in tune, <laughs> a, a rig that is pretty predictable and doesn't have a lot of possibilities for failure, and then it is very easy to set up. I don't want to be a roadie. I want to come in and set up and, and play my guitar. So. Um, that's pretty much, as far as my rig, that's pretty much what I have come down to. Well, you are a pretty much self-contained individual. You do <laughs> not have anybody carrying your stuff in and out or set up. You're, you're the guy. You're there from, yeah, from the beginning thanks, to the thanks, end. Mark. I, I don't, I never minded roading my own equipment. Um, I always felt like why should anybody mind about carrying their toys around with them? You know, because they, they are to they're tools of the trade, but they are toys. Yeah. And uh, uh, when the day they stop becoming toys for me is the, the day that, you know, I'll be very sad. <laughs> so, but, you know, one thing about you still is, is you you express modesty. You're an endorsed individual by how many different brands? Well... Really, probably the Fender and Dorsey is my biggest one, and uh, that was uh, all. That all happened when I went, you know, played the LA Music Awards, 
and uh, there was a couple people who really helped me with that. Um, Jeff Bowen, who's a great player himself, and he was the local Fender rep, tri-state Fender rep for years around here. And Jeff helped me get that Fender endorsement. And so, but but that's pretty much that's pretty much it. You know, I, I never I was never uh, what some people in the music call a product whore. I never, you know, I, I endorsed a few products. That's just because I believed in them. Mm -hmm. um, but I never was the kind of guy who was out trying to get endorsements and get money and get fame so I could from from endorsements. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's just not something I wanted to pursue. Well, and, you know, it used to be that was kind of a reverse being endorsed. It was, the you know, the product manufacturers wanted to have right. the hottest players playing their stuff. That's right. You know, instead That's of right. vice versa, hey, what do I got to do to get a free product from this company and I'll show off for you. That's right. And I, I, that's, that's pretty much, I mean, you know, that's a really good analogy of it. And uh, you have to get pretty dang well known for companies to start coming after you for that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, if, if that would have happened to me, I would have I gladly, you know, supported what I believed in. Um, and taking the free guitars and amps and whatever, the, or the big discounts or whatever, you know, uh, Fender. I did, you know, I did get discounts um, on. I just wanted an, a custom shop Fender Strat, and so that was the one thing that I got a really great price on. I didn't get it for free, but I got a good price on it you know, with my endorsement. That was really cool. See, and that stuff that most musicians really want to know and don't really know how to do so yeah. maybe that's i mean we we've talked about doing you know master class clinics with individuals like yourself that have been successfully doing things so that others might catch some of your wisdom or whatever you want to call it to get recognized i you know endorsed yeah. is kind of a uh -huh grand statement but i mean even getting recognized going to nam you know and yeah things like that so the other part of this technology point i wanted to make is you uh you also have a series of cds called guitarscapes right we haven't talked about that i mean that's a, is that a development point in your career or what yeah there's a specific reason that that happened um after uh, the F five, after the F five, dodging the Dream Killers project, I came back and uh, we basically there was a little misunderstanding between a previous manager and the management company for F five. So I got I just got put on hold from the record company and um, sent basically sent home. <laughs> you know so. And I had been with three record companies at that point, and I, it kind of, it was, it kind of, uh, it just, let's say, sent me a new direction. I went home, totally homegrown. I mean, the first Guitarscape CD, I sat down with a, just a DAT machine. And I, re I recorded just a bunch of live guitar playing, kind of improv, and then took a couple of them up to Coop Studios with uh, Kip Kipper, who is a magnificent um, producer. And he helped me with that one. And then he also helped me get into Pro Tools when that was for start, starting to come out. So I basically um, took this endeavor of, all right, enough of the rock and roll. Um, it's worn me out. I'm tired. I created the Guitarscapes, which was just a very, very um, mellow music background while still being able to play electric guitars. It's kind of like um, a mellow, mellow um, setting for electric guitars. And I did six, five of those CDs. And 
they were basically inspired by the travels from Los Angeles to Colorado, where you'd go through Grand Canyon, uh, Mo, you know, Moab. I mean, these beautiful areas. So almost the whole, all the whole guitarscapes thing was inspired by um, that area. So, you know, if you pick up the CDs and you, you want to, you know, want to experience them the way I kind of created them, grab a, one of those CDs and travel through uh, the Canyonlands sometime and see what it does for you. I don't know. Um, but that's what, that's why that happened. I was really frustrated and tired, exhausted from the music business, and um, came back to Colorado Springs and, and started doing that. So is there a sequence of from first to last that started with this vision and you built more and more and more into, or is it just the whole collection of Michael Reese's mind coming out through his fingers? It's, it's kind of like a life choices that you do make and some that you don't make. And, you know, that kind of guides you to what you're going to create next. At least it, it did me. So that was a, um, you know, the Dragonflyer CD was my first chance to put my instrumental music out on a, on, in a real studio. And back then, you know, it, it, that CD cost, it was around $26,000 to do that CD. And that's a fair chunk of money, you know, back in the, back in the 90s. And then... You know, I had some management, and they did some really nice things, and got you know in the L.A. Music Awards and and stuff like that. And that was my I, that was when I was still to the point where I really wanted to show the world what I could what I could do with my um, uh, compositions and my playing. So I really kind of went um, balls out, excuse the expression, to do my most uh, electric uh, playing while still trying to keep the composition in mind and still trying to have some beautiful melodies in the music because I think basically that's what most people connect to. Not everybody's going to connect to uh, an hour of shredding licks on a CD. I mean, you, if you listen to Joe Satriani, he shreds like amazing, but he's got also these beautiful melodies that are songs you just go wow that really grabs me here and it stems all the way back to the guys like from Clapton to Santana, Jeff Beck uh, uh, I, I can't even name all the players from that era that you know Jimmy Page, um, Shuggy Otis, Mike Bloomfield I mean they're, they're, they're yeah. Tommy Bolin there's so many of them but um, Kind of losing my track here, but anyway, the point is, is that your life t as an artist to me kind of leads you to what your music, what what's going to come out of you and your creations.